Hey everyone, welcome back to another review, and this time we are talking about Mike Grell's run on Iron Man. Now, Mike Grell was on the book from issue 50 to issue 64, and at this point, there's a lot of stuff that influences the movies, a lot of stuff that builds off of the previous parts of Volume 3, and a lot of stuff that starts to retcon. Iron Man, ever since Busick got on the book, pretty much the entirety of Volume 3 of Iron Man, is about writers trying to figure out what the hell to do with him. Because up to Kaminsky, Iron Man has a pretty strong... Problems here and there, a second McLean late run isn't that good, but otherwise a pretty strong progression. Everything from the initial creation up to the end of Kaminsky's run is for for the most part a progress a progression of that character. It's that person coming to certain plateaus in his life, and by that point you could get away with ending the book. And then they didn't end the book. So after Kaminsky's 318, there is more Iron Man. And then everything from from 319 up to the Heroes Are Born stuff with the young Tony and the evil Tony and the Kang possession and um, all of that stuff just kind of broke Iron Man. And then we can get into Busick's run, which is, for the most part, starting fresh, new direction, a little bit older, a little bit wiser, a little bit of a new direction, a little bit more of an exaggeration, and... Busick left a bit too soon, um, and, and not all those plot threads got wrapped up, and he decided to push them over to some other place. And then Casada tried to do his own thing, and it started well, but ended poorly. And then Frank Thierry tried to do his own thing, and that started well and ended poorly. And then we're here with Mike Grell, who tried to put his own stamp on the book. And then when that didn't completely work out, we, we cut forward to um, Robin Law's run on the book, who tried to put his own stamp on things, and that didn't really work out. And then John J. Miller would come on and do his thing, which doesn't really work out. And then Volume 3 ends with like three or four issues by Mark Ricketts, which just serves as one big reminder of we have no idea what to do with Iron Man. And every single run, every single run ends with an issue that says... Next month, a bold new direction for Iron Man, the character you've never seen him before. Every run after Busick is advertised as the big brand new face and, and, and direction for this character, and none of them lasted as long as Busick's run. All of these runs vary in length from anywhere between 7 issues to, at most, maybe 17 issues. For the most part, this is a, this is a very unstable period for that character. Um... So we'll go ahead and start talking about Mike Grell's stuff. So Mike Grell wanted to, in, in an interview, he says he wanted to go back to like old school Iron Man. He wanted to give him like the charging batteries and making sure he had the mechanical contraption on his chest and everything. And the mechanical heart comes from the sentient armor stuff in Casada's run, but a lot of that gets retconned in and out. Um, we we make sure we understand that Tony has to recharge his heart and that he's got a mechanical heart now. But we don't reference the fact that by the end of Frank Thierry and Casada's stuff, the heart was evolving. The heart was feeding into other organisms and getting better. And we just we completely ditch all of that. And we start very fresh. Issue 50 uses a brand new armor. And the new armor exists because after the stuff we did with the Sons of Yinsen and the Frank Thierry stuff uh, and the Frankenstein syndrome arc, Tony doesn't trust the skin technology anymore because it's compromised by Ultron, and so now he comes out with a new armor, um, that ultimately being the Tin Man armor, which is just a nickname it has in the Iron Manual. Uh, the Tin Man armor is, if you've seen the Extremis armor, if you've seen that armor, it's exactly like that, with the exception of two lines that come off of the neck around the collar area, and the mouthpiece is different. It, the helmet seems to alternate depending on whoever is drawing the book at the time. Um, but for the most part, it's 99% the exact same look as what eventually becomes the Extremis armor. Now, this book, the Mike Grell run, started in 2002. So 
This is post 9-11 Iron Man. Everything from the rest of uh, Volume 2 is post, or sorry, for everything from the end of, of Volume 3, everything from this point of Volume 3 is post 9-11 Iron Man. And that is abundantly clear from the very beginning. Mike Grell, if you don't know, had a stellar run on Green Arrow that everyone heralds as one of the best runs in comics, and it's fantastic. I highly recommend getting it. DC's reprinting all of it right now. Uh, if you can get all the issues, go ahead and get the issues. But it's a fantastic run, and it returns Oliver back to like the urban hunter kind of idea, and we see him exploring social issues and political uh, ideologies and basic superhero action from as low on the ground as possible. And the biggest thing with Mike Grell's run with Iron Man is that he kind of does the same thing with Tony. Ultimately, his run on Iron Man is a very similar in both in structure and in style to the way he handled Green Arrow, which both characters, the the oversimplification, which I don't believe in, but the oversimplification is Green Arrow is just Batman with a bow and arrow, Iron Man is just Batman with a suit of armor, and that's not true, but it, with that bias in mind, I think what people thought they were getting with Mike Grell on Iron, on Iron Man was that, well, oh, he did Green Arrow, and the only difference between Green Arrow and Iron, and, and Iron Man is a suit of armor, so obviously you just handled them the, exactly the same way. And he doesn't do that completely, but there's very much a been-there-done-that vibe from his writing because he has been there and done that. The big thing here, the big plus I can give it over the Frank Thierry stuff is Frank Thierry, Frank Thierry tried to turn Iron Man into um, supportive of capitalism. And Busick's run is very clearly not that. And I said in my previous review that you can do that. It is within the realm of possibility for this character to be sympathetic to capitalism. I don't have a problem with you doing that, provided you write it well. The issue with, Bu with um, the Thierry stuff is that it comes far too quickly and it feels out of character and we don't live with that personality or that shift in, in characterization long enough to appreciate that turn. Mike Grell does that better. Mike Grell makes sure Tony is a capitalist, but the but he balances that philosophy with everything we've seen Iron Man care about in the past. He is still the type of person that cares about everyone too much. The kind of person that is unable to be selfish, that his form of selfishness is to constantly give things back to people, uh, and whether that's good for him or bad for him, and that's interesting. Um, I, I like that he's able to make that work more, and I like that he's able to turn the book political without doing what what John J. Miller would do later, um, without turning it into a political mouthpiece, without ter without transforming its genre. A lot of that's interesting. We open his first issue in um, a Middle Eastern battle zone, and Tony has flashbacks to when when he first got hurt. And they do a little bit of the updating of the origin stuff. There are about four, um, maybe four. I think about four big changes to Iron Man's origin. Um, there's the original origin, which comes in, into Tales of Suspense. There's an updated origin that happens. I want to say towards the end of Burns stuff, maybe towards the start of Kaminsky stuff. Uh, and then here, there's a bit of an updated origin. And we do kind of the Invincible Iron Man movie thing of Iron Man, of, of Tony experimenting with designs for a suit of armor before he becomes Iron Man, which I don't like. But the suit of armor thing is interesting here because he's in this Middle Eastern battle zone and the suit of armor he designed in his, in his youth that um, eventually led him getting hurt is this suit that is constantly able to keep going. He made sure that it is basically indestructible, um, like circuits lined with titanium and stuff. And the whole idea behind the suit is if you get hurt, it sends you painkillers. If you're about to lose consciousness, it makes you and makes sure you're awake. If you're if you're running too high, it gives you a sedative. It is a suit that is designed to do nothing but kill the enemy and to constantly keep you alive as long as possible to, to kill the enemy. And he programmed it with a very sm simple AI, the AI being survive. And so the suit keeps going and makes you keep going until you are dead on your feet. And it's basically the biggest, most horrific, most evil 
um, contraption, military-industrial complex personification you could possibly have. It is the vilest thing imaginable, and that's the point. And I think that's really interesting because Tony, in that point, became so much about the inventions that he forgot to care about people, and so now throughout his life he's been overcompensating to rectify that and so there's a woman that he he talks to while he's in this battle zone and he loses his armor um that uh he he sort of bonds with and while he's trying to get his armor back and help take out the army uh help take up the armies that are attacking the rebels in this area um the woman puts on the battle suit and so she's kind of just damned to to be stuck in it uh and it's a really interesting idea and by the end of the issue, we establish this theme of if only Tony Stark had a heart, which is something that the movies do a lot, and here it's the opposite, which is interesting, that they they do a lot with this idea of Tony's heart is artificial, but Tony's heart, as in metaphorical, as metaphorical emotional, caring for others, is also kind of artificial because it's completely based on past mistakes and not something that may necessarily be inherent to him. And over time, he learns that that's not true. Over time, he realizes that he does care genuinely for people. It's just his guilt that outweighs that, which is interesting. Um, Tony has this program in this run called The Haven, which is basically, he takes young girls that, that are prostitutes or homeless people or kids all over the place, and he just takes them to this haven where he says, this is a place with a, with a person that, that runs it that used to be in your shoes, that I helped, that got better, that made something of our life, that survived the unfairness of the world. If you want to, you can take my resources and my people and find a way to better your life. And if you don't want to, that's okay too. It's basically just a shelter. And it's really interesting. And it, it it's... Something that Iron Man's been doing historically for a long time, but this is the most it almost bleeds over to something like the Wayne Foundation. And even then, Tony is so much more personal about this. Like, Bruce Wayne establishes charities and stuff, but and he visits them occasionally, but he doesn't, like, spend his days there. And Tony does. Tony goes to the Haven regularly. Like, he's he knows everyone that's there. Everyone... That that's rescued and taken there knows who Tony Stark is and has has have had conversations with him, and I think that's really interesting. I like that he's just he's almost got Matt Murdock style Catholic guilt, and I really like that. Um, we also introduced this new character who's basically the son of the Mandarin. The Mandarin left a kid at this temple, and after he came of age, he was going to take over the Mandarin's work for him. And this kid spends all of his time training and becoming a master, and eventually he gets a box with the hands of the Mandarin. Because if you remember back in John Byrne's run in the Dragon Seed Saga, Iron Man channeled his repulsor tech through the Mandarin's rings, which was used to kill all of Fin Fang Foom's dragon ally things and in doing that mandarin lost his hands and so those hands are now in this box along with his rings um it doesn't retcon hands of the mandarin when mandarin woke back up and had dragon hands and it doesn't retcon revenge of the mandarin because there is a reference to the dragon of heaven here but it does seem to kind of just pave over what we were promised because the way busick's revenge of the mandarin ends it ends with this notion of i didn't come here to defeat you in one go. I came here to test you and to taunt you and to make you realize that I will always be back. Like, the way the Revenge of the Mandarin end to, ended, there is this clear implication of a bigger, better Mandarin story coming from Busick, and we never got that. And so, this is paving over that, and so this kid is now just this promised child of the Mandarin that's going to take out Tony Stark, and it all becomes all about destiny, that the sins of the father were passed on to the son, and the only way this kid's life can go now is to take out Iron Man. And he did, he has to fulfill the Mandarin's work, not necessarily the way the Mandarin wanted, but in some way to get to the same goal. And that's really interesting, especially when you factor in some of the stuff with what Kaminsky did with Tony Stark's uh, history and parentage and how his father was an alcoholic and Tony became an alcoholic and how both of them are like these broody loner types but have like this outward persona of something being greater and I think that's really interesting. I like the parallels between those two characters and the fight with them is, is interesting. The Mandarin essentially um, 
the new Mandarin essentially creates this drug, or the Mandarin creates this drug called the Sleeping Dragon, and the Mandarin son sort of takes over those operations, and from there we get like a pretty interesting fight between them. Um, also in this is the creation of Tony Stark's AI Friday. You may know her from Civil War and Age of Ultron. Now, Tony had Jocasta from the end of Busick's run all the way through Casada and Thierry's run at the end of the Ultron stuff, the, the Frankenstein Syndrome stuff, um, there's this body that gets the, uh, that gets the Jocasta AI installed into it and Jocasta gets to go and be her own person. And so now Tony creates a new AI, which is Friday, and she's kind of got this, um, Looney Tunes sense of humor. She's really, she's got, a really sarcastic sense of self, and, and, and she's really snappy and funny. Um, like, he says that, you, that um, like, Pepper comments on it, and Tony's like, she's got some bugs left to work out, and then she turns into Jessica Rabbit, Rabbit and says, I can't help the way I'm programmed. Um, and, like, it's, it's kind of fun. Like, she's, she's the biggest bit of comic relief. When Tony asks her for, like, sit reps, she turns into, like, a weather girl and gives him, like, a forecast. It's kind of funny. Um, but that's Friday in a nutshell. Um, now, Friday factors into this, into the Mandarin stuff as well. I won't talk too much more about that. But essentially, as Tony goes to fight the Mandarin's operation, it happens because Tony gets attacked by the girl that puts on the battle suit from the opening arc. And because she was in this battle suit, she has to constantly survive. She can't kill herself. The only way for her to die is for Tony to kill her, like stop her heart permanently. And so Tony refuses to kill her, and so she decides that she's going to go after someone Tony loves, so Tony kills her out of hate. And so she is this product of a war-torn world and becomes a war-torn person. And she goes up to Pepper Potts, and she attacks Pepper, and Pe Pepper is hospitalized, and it turns out that Pepper was pregnant, and she loses the baby, and she decides not to feel happy. And we'll talk about some of the ramifications of that when we get to the later run. But... The biggest problem with that, and this run in general, because basically what happens is after Pepper's injured, Tony goes after her, and in going after her, he runs into the Mandarin's operation. But basically what the problem here is, Busick teased a Pepper-Tony relationship, which I wasn't fond of, which culminated in them kissing and realizing, nah, they're just friends. Um, and then we kind of respected that for a while until Grell came on, and Grell started teasing this again. So now Pepper and Tony talk about this in terms of something they wanted to rectify and something that maybe a mistake in their past led them to be just friends. And so they're kind of still hung up on this potential relationship. And I, I can't be sympathetic for Happy and Pepper losing a child if I'm constantly being beat over the head with the idea that Pepper and Tony are meant to be together. It completely throws Happy Hogan under the bus, and when we get to the next run and he starts to become an alcoholic, I don't blame the guy because of how how much disrespect that he gets in, his, in, in the comic that Pepper and Happy have been a couple for like 40 years, and then suddenly Busick brings Pepper and Happy back into the book, and now suddenly we were doing love triangle things again, and it feels like Happy, every time he gets one step forward, he gets two steps back because Tony Stark's got to steal the spotlight. And it's really depressing, not because, not because, um, Happy talks about it in those terms, but just as a reader of like, this character is just constantly being tortured. I'm not digging that. I, I really wish some writer would come on and, and let the Pepper happy relationship foster and, and grow and, and be something more than this kind of easy getaway drama. Um, all of that's going on. Tony goes to, to fight this girl, eventually fights the Mandarin's kid. He disappears and Tony's, um, take, uh, as Tony's armor shut down and then he's, um, driven back to, to Stark Enterprises. And when he gets back at issue 55, um, Tony's company has, plummeted in the stocks, everyone's worried about what's going on, um, and so Tony teases a big announcement. Now, this issue is issue 55, and as volume 3 went on, it started to get double numbered, and so you had, like, the number of the volume you're reading, so like issue, 50, uh, issue 55, but you also had the number based off of the continuation of Iron Man. So, end of volume 3 is, I think, 332, and then from 332, you have the Heroes Are Born stuff and the Busick stuff and all that. And so you're adding all these numbers on to the book 
And so it's got double numbering. So issue 55 is both issue 55 of volume 3 and issue 400 of Iron Man overall. Now, the volume numbering thing is crazy and doesn't make any sense. And I will I, I talked about that on, on Geek Evolution, um, GNN I did. So um, you can go back and watch that and, and, and hear me rant about how volume numbers are stupid. But regardless, this issue 55 is the 400th issue of Iron Man. And so Tony teases this big announcement as, as to how he's going to get Stark Industries back or Stark Enterprises back on track. And Happy's like, okay, what do you got? And then Tony's like, I don't know. I'm just making this up as I go along. Um, and so while he's talking to Rumiko, who I'll talk about in a minute, um, he sees a dog that's about to get run over by a truck. And so he jumps off of the ledge, puts on his armor, and saves the dog. And from there, everyone sees that Tony Stark is Iron Man. And so the big announcement becomes Tony Stark is Iron Man, and the secret identity is revealed. Um, and so now he becomes this celebrity figure in multiple ways. And um, we completely break down the false bodyguard idea and everything. And it's kind of cool. It's a pretty cool shock value reveal. And you get some pretty interesting moments of Tony out of that because now he's famous 24-7. Um, now, I mentioned I talked about this again, but Rumiko. So I, I made... I made sure I addressed the fact in the previous reviews that I think she's the worst Iron Man love interest ever, and I stand by that, because here she's even more insufferable, that she just shows back up out of nowhere despite being written out of the book earlier, and now there's no hint of that leader-type character that Busick turned her into, or had as, as a layer underneath her. Now she's just this crazy party girl that hates the fact that Tony wants to save the world instead of spend time with her. She's constantly jealous of the people Tony rescues just because that's an extra minute Tony isn't with her. And I hate that. She becomes one of the most annoying, most selfish characters, most selfish love interests ever, and it's just more nails in the coffin of female characters in comics because it's another one of those characters that's invented to advance the plot of the male character, but then despite initially being a good character in their own right, gets completely shafted for the sake of cheap drama, and I hate that. I, she's just, she's an insufferable character. What can he do? Um, we also see the return of Ty Stone in Dream Vision. He ultimately dies at the end of the couple uh, story arc. Um, we have a time travel story towards the end called Shine, In Shining Iron, which is another one of those moments where Tony talks about how he wants to go back in time and change something, and it's very very heavily hinted at that the thing he wanted to create the time machine for was to go back and change a moment that allows him and Pepper to be together. And I hate that. That's awful. Um, there's a Christmas story towards the end that reinforces Rumiko's annoying selfishness. Um, and then the final issue, six, uh, issue 64, is a crossover uh, called Standoff, which is a Thor storyline with, with like a cult of Thor worshippers and stuff, and it's the first appearance of the Thorbuster armor. Um, but that's basically the end of, of this run, and overall, there's some really interesting things here, particularly towards the beginning, up to issue 55, it's a pretty interesting run, but then it kind of dies very quickly. Um, a lot of what Grell's doing is kind of been there, done that Iron Man storytelling, and it's very clearly trying to find its own voice and kind of trying to throw elements in and out and alter status quo just to see if Grell can like force the book to eventually become a story he feels like he can write. Like it never feels like he has a plan going forward. It feels like he's constantly throwing experiments out, throwing darts at the wall and seeing what sticks. Um, and none of it sticks really by the end. The only thing he does here that has some real consequence is the creation of Friday and Tony revealing himself to the world. Um, the happy Pepper Tony stuff gets picked up on next time when we talk about Robin Law's run, but even that is just a long-lasting problem before it's really interesting. And I feel like Grell noticed that, so he just kind of quit. Um, or at least quit with that point. So this isn't good, per se. I think it's interesting in places, but ultimately... I don't really like it. I wouldn't really recommend it. As of this recording, you can't find a... Tr there is no trade collection of this run. Um, if there was one, if it was cheap, maybe pick it up just out of curiosity to see uh, where the movies get a lot of their influence from. Um, don't go to the trouble of tracking down all the issues because it's kind of not worth it. Uh, but that's the end of Mike Grell's Iron Man run. Really not digging this. I don't think it's very good. I'll be back next time with more Iron Man to talk about Robin Law's run. Um, but let me know what you think in the comments, whether you agree or disagree with anything I said, and I'll see you next time.